thanks folks for coming out because it's a really beautiful day and there won't be many for the next couple of days. But um, <laughs> yeah, anyway, thanks for coming. Thanks for the Philly Socialist, um, um, Tim, John, and all the um, rest of the group for bringing me. Um, is my, am, am I speaking loud enough? Can you hear me okay in the back? Yeah? All right. So today I'm going to defend the idea of a party, and Rachel, we can start our slides. Um, and I'm gonna defend the idea of the party by setting out the conditions that make it necessary. Now I'm not imagining here a national electoral party, but rather a solidary militant international organization. Bruno Bastille's formulation is helpful here. Party names the flexible organization of a fidelity to events in the midst of unforeseeable circumstances. So let me repeat this one more time. So party names the flexible organization of a fidelity to events in the midst of unforeseeable circumstances. Against left realists who claim that the party is an outmoded or fully saturated political form, who claim that we are relegated to momentary acts of resistance or small reforms that leave the capitalist system intact. I argue that our conditions push us to rethink and renew that form of political organization through which communists think collectively about political power, act together in order to generate it, and inspire one another to use it for the collective determination of the world we produce in common. Capitalism pushes us apart. Left politics shouldn't do the same. Instead of emphasizing fragmentation, locality, and irreconcilable difference, it should assert and build commonality. The party is a form for this assertion. And I think we heard earlier about some of the great things Philly socialists are doing for you know, building common power, right? I, mean, I love Children's Caucus, that's really great. A great name for daycare. Um, so in, um, in 2008, the left failed. There was a major crisis of capitalism inviting urgent response, but the left was a no-show. The consequence has been more than bank bailouts and austerity. It's been the rise of the extreme right as the most visible opponent of neoliberal governmental policies. And of course, not just in the UK and the US, but even more dramatically in Greece. The same crisis continues to deepen such that in the US, UK, and EU, there is now both a new normal of intensifying inequality and a fundamental uncertainty as to the terms and conditions of this new normal. And I should add that this is broadly accepted. As Capitalist, a magazine as Barron's featured a cover, a cover article on the snail economy in which it predicted increasing social unrest as growth decreases and inequality increases. Needless to say, the premise of the article is that the continuation of the liberal, is of the continuation of the liberal state and the capitalist economy. So Barron's thinks that it's bad that there's gonna be um, you know, continued social unrest, but it takes for granted the increase in inequality. It assumes that too. At any rate, none of us know exactly what this new condition that exceeds the political economic settlements of welfare state and neoliberal state will be like. Right? None of us know. And this non-knowledge, this openness, is the opportunity for action. It's the space where we can push for one future over another if we have the collective political will to do so. Is our setting one that can only be ongoing cuts and austerity, rising immiseration, reactive protest, and intensified police violence? I mean, this is what the Barron's piece implies. Or can there be collective steering of a world that we create, use, and inhabit in common? The crumbling of capitalist realism, right, the conviction that there is no alternative, this crumbling has enabled ever more of us to see capitalism as the system of production through exploitation for the benefit of the few. No one denies the fact that some always lose in the capitalist economy. What's contested is whether it's fair, just, and better than the alternatives. But then what? It now seems as if it's easier to imagine the end of global capitalism than it is an organized left. Oddly echoing Thatcher, there is no alternative, left realists insist that collectivity is undesirable and impossible. 
It's undesirable because it excludes possibilities, effaces difference, and enforces discipline. It's impossible because we are so individuated, so singularized in our needs and ambitions, so invested in the primacy of one set of tactics over another that we can't ever come together. Left realists tell us that the idea of coming together itself has to be exposed as an illusion. They tell us that it's a myth that some use to manipulate others into fighting for their interests, that the fundamental changes in the world economy preclude party formation. Now, for a lot of folks, particularly young people just coming into um, action or people who've had a lot of experiences um, that would have been frustrating, for many um, you know, for, with this background, left realism feels realistic. To others, it feels realistic because it resonates with the prevailing ethos of late neoliberalism that tells us to do it ourselves, stay local and small, and trust no one because they will only betray us. In her important new book, Coming Up, Sh Up Short, the sociologist Jennifer Silva summarizes the results of her interviews with 100 young working class adults in Massachusetts and Virginia. And the average age of the folks that she was interviewing was 27. Silva's findings contrast with research um, on previous generations of working class adults. Um, and so this is one of the things that makes it interesting, right? She's giving us new sociological information that's, um, com that's come from her work with you know, um, young working class adults. Okay, so um, what she finds is that for young working class adults today, an ethos of hard work and solidarity has been replaced by a profound individualism and sense of distrust. Silva writes, Experiences of powerlessness, confusion, and betrayal within the labor market, institutions such as education and the government, and the family teach young working class men and women that they are completely alone, responsible for their own fates, and dependent on outside help at their peril. They are learning the hard way that being an adult means trusting no one but yourself." End quote. People are reluctant to pour time, emotion, and energy into relationships that are risky. Although Silva emphasizes the impact on romantic relationships, we can extend this to a broader unwillingness to attach oneself to groups and causes. An inability to commit is an effect of economic insecurity that makes political organization as challenging and precarious as romantic association. It's hard to know whether or not it's worth it, for many, past experiences suggest that it won't be, that the most likely outcome is betrayal. Silva notes the foundational belief in self-reliance among African Americans in her study as they narrate their experiences in terms of their own individual experiences rather than in terms of the structural impact of race and class. So their stories when, they, um, when she's interviewed them are all about how they as individuals feel, what happened to them individually, not in terms of any structural class um, categories like race or class. Solidarity, social trust, and community engagement then plummet as the primary worldview conceives rights in terms of eyes rather than we's, and economic justice drops completely out of the collective vocabulary. In a powerful and disturbing chapter on the hardening of working class individualism, Silva describes some of her white informants' defenses of big business and their hostility toward affirmative action. They feel betrayed and this makes them trust the market. These working class people feel the market to be impersonal, a matter of risk and chance. When government intervenes, it does so in ways that rig the game so that they can't compete. Furthermore, since so many of Silva's informants have had to struggle on their own by themselves in contexts of poverty and diminishing opportunity, they take the fact of their survival as itself morally significant. Making it on one's own bestows dignity. In this view, socialists like Obama take away their last best thing, the special something that is all they have left, namely, the dignity they have precisely because 
they are completely self-reliant. Silva's account suggests that solidarity is a problem because to embrace it would be to acknowledge one's insufficiency as an individual, one's inability to survive alone, and thus one's, one's own lack of the dignity self-reliance bestows. Hence, some working class people are hostile to those below them on the food chain who need help from others because this hostility enables them to project neediness onto others and shore up their own fragile and impossible individuality. Silva argues that young working class people have learned that they can't rely on anyone. They try to numb their sense of betrayal by affirming the worst cultural scripts of individualism, pers personal responsibility, and self-reliance. They harden themselves to the world around them and thus become exactly the subjects capitalism needs insofar as they are hostile to various forms of government intervention, particularly affirmative action. It might be then that some of the critical exposés many of us on the left write and circulate, the stories of governmental corruption and the failing education system, that those aren't actually helping our cause at all, Instead, they're affirming what the working class already knows to be true, they're being betrayed. Amidst the uncertainties of late neoliberalism, even when we are fully conscious of our own exploitation, of the deep inequity of the capitalist system, we find ourselves confirming and conforming to the dominant ideology. Turn inward, enclave, emphasize the singular and momentary. Either we don't feel like we can do anything about it, or we participate in individuated, localized, or communicatively mediated activities with which lack momentum, duration, or political memory. People are immiserated and proletarianized and confront this immiseration and proletarianization alone. Isolation, immiseration, and political disorganization also characterized the early decades of revolution, revolutionary socialism. Marx, Engels, and Luxembourg all emphasize how competition means that workers tend to remain isolated, light, lack solidarity, and take a long time to unite. This is why unions and parties have to be created, and why creating them is a struggle. Today, left, realize, left realists one-sidedly emphasize the objective dimension of our present cap capitalist setting, failing to acknowledge the subjective dimension of organization and will that pushes against this setting. This subjective dimension has also always been part of the Marxist tradition. Now, there are, of course, some significant differences between our time and the early years of revolution revolutionary socialism. Rather than a period of working class advance, ours is one of defeat. In our extreme capitalist setting, the rollback of the achievements of organized political struggle means austerity and privatization, particularly privatization accompanied by increases in brutality and exemption as practices formerly under public authority are turned over to personal power in the market. For us, authoritarianism is less that of centralized state power than it is a power decentralized, dispersed, and extended via private contracts, interbank and interagency cooperation, and the extensive network of treaties, agreements, and provisions enabling capital flow and global trade we encounter the fragmentation, dislocation, and decomposition of some elements of the state, and the concentration and intermeshing of other elements of states and markets, as in finance, security, and media. Capital as a class has worked to smash the bureaucratic state machine for us, to convince us that it's useless, even as it strengthens parts of it for its own ends. So we confront an uneven mix of centralizing and decentralizing forces in various combinations of state use of the market and market reliance on the state. The state's operation as an instrument of class rule is now tempered less by concession forced by the concessions forced on it by working class struggle than it was 40 years ago, although of course the social democratic class compromise was not itself without political cost. Capital resurgent has reclaimed a great deal of ground 
but it doesn't erase the fact of prior struggles. Indeed, our time is particularly difficult because there has been a world in which basics such as housing, education, health, food, and work have been understood and treated as rights. Those determined to defend capitalism try to convince us that this world failed, that it suppressed our freedom, that doing, um, that doing it oneself and going it alone is the better way to live. Although the left failed in 2008, new possibilities emerged as academics and activists again turned to the idea of communism. These possibilities have been amplified by struggles in the UK, in Wisconsin, Egypt, Spain, Greece, Turkey, and of course the Occupy movement. It's safe to say that without protest on the ground, the return to communism would not have been anything at all, just like academics going to conferences. Crucial to the current appeal of the idea of communism, though, is that communism is the one word we have that says no compromise with capital and that asserts a powerful alternative. Linked to class struggle, the smashing of the bourgeois state, and the abolition of private property, communism is more than social democratic compromise, post-structuralist pluralization, and anarchist insurrection. It's a substantive vision of justice, from each according to ability to each according to need. So instead of a politics thought primarily in terms of resistance, playful and momentary aesthetic disruptions, the immediate specificity of local projects, and struggles for hegemony within a democratic milieu, the horizon communism impresses on us is the necessity of replacing capitalism with global practices and institutions of cooperative, egalitarian production and administration of the common and the commons. Communism turns us away from lifestyle changes, general inclusion, and momentary calls for awareness, and toward opposition, division, organization, and solidarity. For Marx, proletariat names capitalism's self-creation of what destroys it. This what that destroys capitalism is a collective subject a force no longer dispersed in individual and local acts of smashing, sabotage, and disruption, but concentrated in solidarity. But how does this collective subject abolish capitalism? It can't be through destruction alone. The normal operation of, cap of the capitalist system is itself characterized by uncertainty and instability, a series of periods of moderate activity, prosperity, overproduction, crisis, and stagnation. Contemporary capitalism has refined its capacity for destruction. Over $34 trillion of market value was lost in the financial crisis of 2008. In the recession that followed, the rich got richer and the poor got poorer, the top 1% captured 121% of the income gains made between 2009 and 2011. Not only was the 1% better able to weather the crisis than the, rest of us, than the rest of us, but it was able to increase its share. Now Marx tells us that the capitalist cycle of creative destruction is brought to an end by the proletariat, not by the working class organized as workers, right? That already happens in the factory. It in the, and, and being organized as workers in the factory enables workers to become conscious of their material conditions and the need to combine into unions. But there's a difference between being organized as workers and being organized by the proletariat, as the, as the proletariat. The abolition of capitalism depends on the organization of the class as a party, a solidary political association that cuts across workplace, sector, region, and nation. The working class as a class is implicated in the success or stability of capitalism. Capitalism configures its struggles with the bourgeoisie. In contrast, the party takes as its horizon capitalism's supersession in communism. The party is necessary because, because class struggle is not simply economic struggle, it's political struggle. It's a and as moments of a common struggle, they each become themselves plus all the others. 
This is part of the opening of Occupy. It gave us ever, um, it gave us more than ever a capacity to see a whole bunch of different things as part of one struggle. So revolts in Egypt, um, students doing debt um, organizing in Montreal, anti-foreclosure struggles in the US, these all became legible as components of one struggle. So back to Marx on voluntary cooperation. As an organization premised on solidarity, the party holds open a political space for the production of a common political will, a will irreducible to the capitalist conditions in which the majority of people find themselves forced to sell their labor power. Where work is obligatory, determined, membership in the party is voluntary, the willed formation of united power. Among its members, the party replaces competition with solidarity. That class struggle is political, means that it exceeds the affirmation of people as workers with particular interests to include the critical assessment of this position as itself the result of inequality and exploitation. Differently put, the working class is a subject of capitalism it is constrained within a field or discourse configured by and for capitalist as a class. It gets its position from within this field. So the working class might refuse and resist sabotage and strike, but all these actions are still confined within a field given by capital, configured for its interests and in its behalf. To be another kind of subject, the subject of another field, discourse, or politics requires a break or a shift, a shift to the field of the party. So the party is more than an outgrowth or extension of labor unions. Um, and this much, I think, should be uncontroversial given the, you know, in the legacy of socialism, given um, the importance of the peasantry, as well as the wide variety of groups that have been founded by socialist and communist parties. The party is a form for abolishing capitalism and ushering in communism. It occupies the place of division, holding it open for a new collective political subject. Now, um, and you know, for classical Marxism, this was the proletariat. In the communist horizon, um, I argue for the concept of the people as the rest of us. Um, though I won't make that whole argument here, but if people want to, we can talk about it in the Q&A. In each instance, though, the point with proletariat or um, the people as the rest of us is to recognize that political subjectification has to be achieved, right? It's not an empirical given or a direct, um, in, you know, di a direct outgrowth of just being in a place. At different points over the past hundred years, the party has attempted to abolish capitalism and usher in communism in various ways. Revolutionary seizure of the state, participation in parliamentary processes, training of cadre and education of masses in order to be prepared when the time comes. The Communist Party has never been simply an organization aimed at achieving a set of economic reforms that would restrain capitalism's extremes and provide workers with welfare guarantees. That this is the case is clear um, when we note the justified sense of betrayal vo voiced by communists when their parties compromise and retreat. They feel betrayed because the party gave way on communist desire, the very desire its wide array of organizations hold open, the desire underpinning solidarity and comradeship. The party is necessary because the people are split. We're split between the ways we're given or positioned within capitalism. We're situated within a field that tells us who we are and what we can be, that establishes the matrix of our desire. And that um, is um, how Zizek defines ideology. But that even as it establishes the matrix of our desire, represses the truth of this, um, re represses the fact that the very truth of this field of this matrix is class struggle. The party asserts this truth, it speaks from the position of this truth, and offers another field of possibilities. That in contrast, opposition to capitalist desire the party opens up the terrain for the desire of another subject, a collective political subject. The party doesn't know everything. It doesn't know very much, actually. It, but it provides a form for the knowledge that we gain through experience 
and a place to analyze this experience from the perspective of the communist horizon. So I'm going to um, kind of wrap up a bit um, by sort of trying to bring it into um, a little bit more of a um, thinking a little bit about um, organization. Um, you know, changing the world that we're in de depends on our ability to generate, concentrate, and sustain political and, and sustain political power. My claim is that we need a party for doing this, right? We need a party if we're going to generate, concentrate, and sustain political, party, uh, political power. I don't think the primary problem here is one of organizational detail with respect to, say, uh, membership requirements or centralization um, versus network structures or leadership. I think the problem is actually political will as a will to come together and consolidate power and build power emerges, people will figure out the structure in light of the challenges we face. Challenges that include expanding militant pressure in ways that inspire and educate cadre, while at the same time straining the resources of the state and breaking the confidence of the finance sector. They include abolishing private property in the capitalist banking system while advancing international coordination in an uneven, an uneven environment. Of course, they involve increasing popular support. And they also involve developing a program for addressing common concerns over climate, health, transportation, communication, food, housing, and education, to mention just a few things. A five or 10 year plan for getting from here to there could be helpful here an alliance of the radical left, or better, a new common or communist party, could grow out of the combined forces of already existing groups, from militants skilled at direct action, to artists adept with symbols and slogans, to parties experienced at organizing, to issue groups knowledgeable about specific areas of concern. Such a combination would let people who want to be engaged in radical politics but aren't sure what to do have a place to go, a place to start. I want to mention here, um, you know, one of the problems that was facing um, the Zuccotti Park occupation was, I mean, after like, particularly after the um, eviction start, um, after they were, everyone was evicted, was that there hadn't been a list taken of like, who's engaged in this? <laughs> Right? Who's involved? So sort of very basic ideas of membership, who's participating, how do we know, what are the intake, what are the intake mechanisms, how do we get folks who don't really know anybody but want to be involved, how do we do that? That was completely missing. So when I say this, um, you know, people need a place to go, a place to start, I mean this in a really very mundane sense, right? Having a named organizations that with addresses um, is actually something that can really matter and can help. I mean, I, I've, you know, I speak on different college campuses and always there's usually one or two students who are like, I really want to get involved, but I don't know, I don't have any idea um, what to do. And a college campus actually usually consolidates those opportunities. And think about folks who don't, who are not on, you know, who are not students, but they want to get involved, they don't know where to go. So I think um, building a party is really useful here for this very basic reason, letting people know where to go. Okay, so um, again, I don't want to underplay um, how deindustrialization and the rise of a service sector impact communist organizing. Today, rather than relying on workers' sense of pride in their work, their understanding of the necessity of their work to the common good, and the resulting counterpower that arises from their unity, communists are in the position of trying to organize and inspire people to abolish their workplaces, um, to eliminate sectors like uh, finance, insurance, and real estate. So there is a problem, right, um, of an organizational problem. What does it mean to, to try to appeal to workers if you're only going to say, well, yeah, your desk job's got to go away? Um, I think that, there, that one way to route around this is eco-socialism, um, appealing to people as inhabitants of the planet capitalism is destroying. Um, organize in terms of abolishing capitalism and transitioning to a sustainable, green, managed economy rather than one oriented to, to accumulation and growth. Another way to route around the kind of current problems of how to organize um, is by emphasizing inequality and the capitalist class's incessant refrain of cuts, privatization, and financialization. 
Here the point would be to mobilize the un and underemployed against the current system and for one that opens up opportunities for education, health, housing and meaningful work on the basis of collective ownership and determination of production and distribution. In 2011, the largest sectors of the U.S. economy by employment were health, retail, education, manufacturing, hospitality, waste management, and public administration. It's not hard to imagine the collectivization and exten extension and reformatting of most of these in a sustainable direction, understanding them as, as producing a common life to be managed in common. The issue that matters is, is constructing the political will um, that can do this. And I think, again, that the party is the organizational form of this kind of, basically it's the organizational form of an answer. How do we construct the political will that could carry these things out? At the most minimal level, if we're to have a chance of taking power, of reformatting the basic conditions under which we live and work, we have to share a name in common as a fundamental marker of division. If not, our names will be given to us by capital, which will seek to fragment and distract us. In the movements of the last few years, we've seen recognition of the power and need for a name in common as a marker of division all the time, right? We are all Khaled Said, we are all occupiers. Right? So we've seen the force when people organize together under a common name and let people know that their actions are allied with a common project. But people on the left still continue to disavow the need for this kind of common struggle. In addition to a common name, we have to build trust, to extend the bonds of trust beyond local ties and small networks. Without solidarity, a common will cannot emerge. Immiseration, precarity, defeat, and betrayal, as well as ongoing patterns of sexism, racism, and homophobia have made us deeply suspicious. One way a party helps deal with this is with explicit criteria for membership and expectation for members, right? It's not just you're a member because you're friends with somebody, right? Friends are there, but there are other ways to be involved. A party supplements personal relations with relations to an organization, holding members accountable to rules and expectations. Another way a party builds trust is by acknowledging different skills and expertise, providing training and education, and delegating tasks. Developing and trusting one another's skills and knowledge is essential if we're to form ourselves into a political force capable of addressing global capital. In practice, this suggests the utility of working groups in multiple locales and issue areas, groups with enough, enough autonomy to be responsive and enough direction to carry out a common purpose, which of course would also have to be hashed out and to which all would have to be committed. So I've suggested a name in common and some basic structural components involving membership organized in cells, delegating tasks, and following a common purpose. The idea behind this rudimentary sketch is that in order to be a flexible and responsive organization, the party has to be a political form of commitment. It has to incorporate, cultivate a solidarity requiring members to put aside endless self-assertion and admit that pulling together is more important than insisting on one's own uniqueness. So I'm going to close actually with four questions. And these are questions that I think that um, the party form pushes us to answer. So I think that even starting to think about left politics in terms of a party forces us to think a little bit differently. And I think it forces us to, to try to think about these kind of four basic questions. First, how do we imagine the world? Are we doomed to continue down a path determined for us? Do we take refuge in a left realist view that tells us, oh, the time is not right? Or do we embrace uncertainty and recognize the ultimately open character of the world in which we participate? Two, how do we imagine politics? Do we take for granted the political system we have and position ourselves within it, repeating time and time again the little moments of rebellion that let us sleep at night? Or 
Do we imagine a different political system and take steps to create it? Third, what do we want? Do we want an end to exploitation, the abolition of private property, and the development of a shared system of responsibility for production and distribution? Or have the last 40 years of, new, of neoliberalism sunk in too deep and make us kind of deeply suspect, yeah, really, you know, there is no alternative to capitalism? Right? How we act here makes a difference. Right? We can act as if we think there's no alternative, or we can make the other alternative. Finally, four, do we dare to avow power, to enact a political association that claims its partiality, that does not imagine itself as the whole of community or as an idealized friendship, but that instead requires fighting side by side against exploiters and for an egalitarian association of free producers. For too long, I think the left has been like, oh no, you know, power is bad, we can't try to avow power. Well, it's no wonder we don't have any, right? If we keep pushing it aside, then we won't have it. So will, you know, do we dare to try to say, yes, political power is something that we need, and do we dare to build it? Right. Thank you all for listening. Thank you.